Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks all for being here today. So um, it's a great honor to have Mark Devin visit, visiting us today. So Mark is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He got his PhD from Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, and he came to uh, Princeton and then to University of Pennsylvania. Um, Mark is working on a four project I read. So the Simon Observatory uh, that we'll uh, listen about today, but also ACT, He's preparing a data release uh, in the few coming months. Um, BLAST, Balloon Born CMB instrument as well, and Mustang, which is mounted an instrument mounted on the 100 meter uh, dish in uh, West Virginia. So um, thank you all for being here. And now we listen to Mark. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks for having me. I was just passing through and decided to, uh, uh, to invite myself over, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to be, as, as Ken pointed out, this is, this is not my map, uh, but it's very beautiful. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about the Simons Observatory, but I'm going to be reviewing a whole bunch of, I was told to review cosmology a little bit. So I'm going to do that at the beginning and, uh, and then touch in a little bit of what we're talking about with the Optikama Cosmology Telescope just briefly, and then move on to, uh, to the Simons Observatory. Uh, the, I'll get back to this, but it's a big project. So quite, quite a few, well, it's a circle. Uh, quite a few uh, uh, people involved with this. I'll get back to that in a little bit. So, um, okay, there we go. Uh, I think everybody's seen uh, slides like this uh, uh, quite a few times in terms of describing the history of the universe. I uh, I really like showing it in, in any case uh, because the amount of information encoded in the slide and the amount of effort that's gone into coming up with what this says is uh, is many decades in the in the uh, in the working, which essentially means that we're we're describing a universe from the, the very first instance to what we see today, how it evolves, why it evolved like that, and actual measurements of the actual thing, right? So a uh, huge amount of effort in going into understanding our uh, vision and our uh, vision of the physics of the universe, and that's essentially why I do this. But in in understanding you know, just basically what's happening is that we really want us to know where is the stuff, where is where are matter, where is matter, where is energy, and how does it evolve with time? Uh, how is it organized? In other words, do we see any organization of the universe, any a large scale structure? And really, how did it get that way? And I used to give a talk for my blast instrument, which is the uh, a sub millimeter balloon borne telescope. And uh, I would show essentially what we're trying to do is take snapshots of the universe at different stages that we can't technically look past the CMB, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but we can take slices of the universe as it grows with the time. We can look at distant objects, distant uh, formations of, of, uh, of matter. And the when we take that snapshot, we say, here's exactly the way it was set up statistically as it evolves with time. And that statistical evolution, the evolution of that universe is a strong function of a number of cosmological parameters of the, the physics of the universe. And so to test all that, we need to make these accurate measurements as we as the universe evolves. And that's a lot of what I've been spending most of my career doing is measuring this evolution of the universe. And of course, well, we're not actually there, but we're somewhere like that. Um, so um, I like to think of the universe as a, uh, or at least the Milky Way galaxy as sort of a clock. I teach Astro One, which is the uh, astronomy course for non-majors at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's very difficult always to give them a sense of the scale of things. And uh, so in this case, the, the Milky Way galaxy rotates every couple hundred million years. Uh, and so just since the birthday, if it was born, if the, if the Milky Way galaxy was created on day one, it really would have only rotated 50 times since, since then, which in my mind is not very much. You know, 50 Milky Way years have passed since the, uh, uh, since the birth of the universe. And in that time, you know, we have to have gone this. This is now actually just PowerPoint background, but I made it up. But, you know, the universe was very smooth uh, 13 billion years ago. And over time, it, it collapses and forms the structures that we see today. And I just feel, you know, in my mind, that's really fast. It's really fast to get that done, uh, to get all that done. And, uh, and that, um, that evolution is, you know, and, and the observing that we see the very, the very early universe and we see the universe now is what motivates us to finding out what it was doing in the interim, what was happening during this entire evolution of the universe. So 
Um, of course, these things have gotten much ever more sophisticated as the modeling of this. And this is just a, uh, not just a, it is a very uh, sophisticated dark matter model of the universe. And again, when you teach Astro One, the students come in thinking, I'm gonna look at stars. And then I realize this is what I see when I look at the universe. I see, you know, cotton candy. I see, <laughs> uh, I, I see a web of, of matter. And and the scale of this of this simulation here, again, stretching from billions of light years down to the light year scale, uh, showing uh, galaxies emitting optical light embedded in this smoky cloud of dark matter, is what a lot of us spend our time thinking about. And how do we? How does this look now? But also, how did it dynamically evolve? Evolve, you know, it didn't just snap into position to look like this. It had to happen over again over several many billion years. But during that process, lots of energetics are happening. In other words, you don't just collapse into this. If you collapse into that, you are dissipating energy when you do that. And how does that all work? Uh, but again, all of this collapses down into this very generic plot, which we see, which is again. Most of what you see here is dark matter and a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, normal matter emitting the light. And when we look at optical images, we're just tracing the galaxies and just a small fraction of the universe. So getting back to a similar image, what we had before, where we have the the uh, the Big Bang and then the evolution and accelerated expansion of the universe here, um, we're now going to be looking at at these different epochs and understanding what what can we learn. Of course, there's an inflationary epoch early on, very early on. Uh, and really, you know, this is an amazing era where things are so compact and so energetic uh, that quantum mechanics, of course, rules. And, uh, and we uh, basically encode uh, that the, the spectrum of fluctuations early on into the cosmic microwave background. And this has been measured um, very accurately by Planck and other experiments. Uh, but also gravity waves, gravity is quantized back then, and those gravity waves are able to propagate. And so while we can't see past the cosmic microwave background at about 380,000 years, uh, we can see the imprint of the gravity waves on the cosmic microwave background. And so they will, and I'll show you a slide on that in a minute. So that then gives us a glimpse into the energy scale of inflation, or the energy scale at the very early universe. Um, Along the way, though, during these uh, different epochs here, you, you form the cosmic microwave background, uh, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on, but um, that cosmic microwave background serves as a backdrop of the universe, and all of that light has to traverse the universe as it's evolving to get to us. Along the way, the universe interacts with the cosmic microwave background, or the cosmic background interacts with the universe, and encodes more information about the evolution of the universe along that path. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But from that, we can learn about, again, the parameters which govern the formation. And I just I just uh, call out here, like the sum of the neutrino masses is actually going to affect what we see in the evolution of the universe. Uh, and then there's dark energy, which I don't know if it's been a lot of time. All right. So uh, this is an act from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope temperature map. Uh, it's a signal dominated map and we're going to spend we're going to spend some time with this uh, to get to know it uh, for those of you who don't do it again i give this talk to uh people who don't haven't seen the cmb before and i used to say it looks like my cat threw up on the page right it doesn't it doesn't look like anything it looks like noise right uh but in fact it is noise in a sense but it is a signal dominated map i mean it is generated uh from uh from fluctuations at the surface of last scattering um but it encodes an enormous amount of information which we'd like to know. And because we throw up a map there that looks static, we think it's static, but it's not static. It's evolving. The, 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 uh, the universe back then is, you know, has acoustic waves traveling through it. This is, again, another PowerPoint feature that you probably didn't know about. But you can do this. Uh, so uh, uh, it's actually not doing that. But the point is that there are sound waves propagating through this. And if there's sound waves and there's compression, there's expansion, and there's all sorts of, of physical things going on there, in addition to this static looking, you know, hot and cold here. And so um, because of that, it, it, you know, there's lots of different features that we can extract from this. Again, so now, not my map, but as Ken says, but uh, so, but from this map, you can then do what we do is, is power spectra, which is, in other words, we understand, we'd like to understand on what scales these things are happening on. So this is a temperature map. Again, hot is red and cold is blue, um, but that's not really important. 
What's more important is to see what scales you see the fluctuations happening on. And so you just take a Fourier transform of this essentially, and you expand it into multipoles. We're about one degree on, on the spherical uh, surface is, is this first hump there that you see there. And this is the Fourier transform of the temperature map. And then we're going to talk about each of these as we go through here. But you've probably heard of the temperature anisotropies, uh, polarization maps of the, of the CMB. We'll go into that in a second. The lens B modes of the polarization maps. <laughs> and, then, and then the primordial B modes. Uh, and I just want to, I'm going to keep pointing out that this is a, uh, a plot, I think, from the CMBS4 science book. That it's, it's so big here. This, this, we, if it was this big, we would have seen it. Okay, so it's much smaller than that. This is just to show it on on the scale. Uh, but from these these kinds of uh, these kinds of spectra and another analysis, we can derive cosmological parameters, which again uh, are we're going to utilize to describe how the universe evolves. And as you know, the baryon density, cold dark matter, and everything that you see here. And from other derived parameters, and then using other other uh, surveys and so forth. We can talk about dark energy, uh, dark matter, and again, as I said before, the sum of the neutrinos and the uh, number of, uh, of light particle. So uh, lots you can do with this. And this is why it's so incredibly fascinating to so many people across so many fields, from high energy physics all the way through astronomy. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, getting back to that ACT map, uh, I didn't actually put a scale on this map on purpose because I wanted you guys to tell me how big it was. Right? How many degrees is this on this guy? Ken can't answer. Okay. And nobody on that can answer. So, you know, how big is this? I just want you to think about it. Given the information that we have, tell me how big the map is, right? And in degrees. And and the answer is, I'll give you a little hint. I just I put that before. That's one degree, right? And so your eye can do a Fourier transfer of this map pretty easily, right? And you can see that there that the dominant power in the map is happening clumpy there, clumpy there, clumpy there. You know, one, two, three, four, five, three. it's about 10 degrees, right, on a side. That's a 100 square degree map. And that's all we do. Okay, it's not quite all we do, but I mean, but that's the general idea is you're taking a Fourier transform of that. And then you see these other fluctuations coming in because clearly there are smaller scale features in there, but the mo most power is happening at around one degree. So how is that happening? Um, well, the, the temperature map is, again, just a Fourier transform. I'm just zooming in. By the way, uh, it's just a Fourier transform of the of the of, of what of the raw map here. Uh, but when you look at um, if you're just a lonely electron sitting in the universe about that time, it's three dimensional. You're not just seeing that's there. There you're seeing everything around you, right? It's you're you're in this 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 uh, universe which is hot and cold. Keeping in mind that these are these are very small temperature fluctuations. It's about one part in ten to the five. Okay, so small temperature fluctuations, but yet if you're an electron there, you see some photons come, coming from up there and then some photons from coming over there. And because we're observing from this direction over here, we only get one polarization from what was interaction from up there and one polarization from over here. And so therefore I get the, this, this uh, polarized signal here. In other words, if it's hot up there and cold over here, I'm going to see just the one polarization from the hot and one polarization from the cold, and I'll see this, this net polarization signal. If it was both the same temperature, the quadrupole was all the same temperature, I would get no polarization signal here. And that's called Thompson scatter. And uh, so from that, I can produce a, a spectrum or a, a map of the polarization signal of the CMB, and it produces a very characteristic polarization signal. And that initial Planck map, if you look carefully, had little squiggly lines on it, which represented the polarization. Right. So, uh, so, so that is what you see here, right? Is this E mode polarization spectrum. So if I take a polarized map of the CMB, I'm going to see this thing. And it is essentially 100% predictable from the temperature map. You know, the temperature map, you should be able to tell me what the polarization map will look like, and certainly what the power spectrum will look. Like. When I was when I was a graduate student, it, you know, we didn't even have this, even the first bump, right? So now we have that down to exquisite. Um, uh, I'm going to guess it. Do this. Turn this. Oh, look at that. And, oh, there we go. All right. So um, if I take the yeah, so we had nothing here. Now we have this to exquisite precision, and now we have this to pretty good, very good precision. 
and we're going after this right, as currently. Now, um, also happening at the surface of the last scattering are these potentially primordial B mode gravitational, gravitational waves basically interacting with the CMB. And that is squeezing and stretching space. And so that results in essentially a motion of the matter, which would then move, make it look very similar to what you're seeing, the same figure I showed you before. But in this case, it, it has a, a different component to it, which produces two types of polarization. One, the same as the one I showed you before uh, from the, uh, the E mode map. But this one here is, is characteristic showed as a B mode pattern, which is inverse under, under flip, right? It's, it's not, it, it changes its uh, uh, parity. So that then produces this pattern that you see, that you see, uh, that you see here, right? And again, this signal is the signal drawn here is much bigger than it than it actually is. So we have this information which is encoded on the on the on the surface of last scattering. Now, the third, the, the final plot on there is is a function of this. And so what we have is again the the um, the CMB map over here, the surface of last scattering, which has a polarization signal in it, and those photons that are created there have to travel through the universe. Again, another PowerPoint uh, uh, trick, just making the photons go here. It's not a real animate, not a real simulation. But as they pass by, they're deflected by this, this large scale structure, um, which is, it has its, its kernel for the graph, the uh, peaking at around uh, redshift around two. So, uh, and all that deflection slightly deflects the photons. Now, this is now going back, flipping back and forth between a lensed and an unlensed map. In other words, this, the gravitational lensing is, is slightly deflecting these photons. And I just keep in mind, it's about a two, uh, it's happening around two degree scales in the sky. So four times the moon. It deflects them by about two arc minutes. And the peak in where it's the effect is at around redshift of two. So lots of twos involved with that. And uh, um, so each of these two maps, they're, they're essentially Gaussian. So you really can't tell if you, you don't know what it is, right? In other words, you, you look at a map and you say, well, it's, it's still random, right? Uh, and how do I know that that's a lens map? And the answer is that this, the cosmic wave background was created 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The universe was only so big, about a degree on the sky, half degree to a degree. And so photons, which are separated by two degrees, can't have known about each other, right? They were not, they would not know about each other. So when they pass by these objects here and things at two degree scales are deflected, we correlate them. So now they know about each other, or at least they have something in common with each other. And it's that correlation which you're looking for in, in these maps, which are called lensed maps, okay? Lensed emote map. And from that, you can create a, a power spectrum like this, which I'll show you just a briefly later on, which is really cool, by the way. I know it's just a plot, but it, for those of us who've been thinking about it, it's, it's really cool because now you're seeing uh, the effect of the formation of structure and the size and shape of this, again, encode a lot of information about how the universe works. All right. So... Uh, so then I'm left with these sort of three maps. I've got the temperature map, the E mode map. Remember, that's the just the directly calculable from this, from Thompson scattering. And then this lens V mode map, which I'm not really showing anything there. But um, if you uh, if you then show what the level of the fluctuations are, it looks look, looks a little bit like that. So uh, so if the universe was not doing any lensing, it would be blank. And if it's doing lensing, then you see this this residual effect uh, from that. Clearly, we can't. You know, we don't. We have to be able to. Uh, derive this map uh, when, when we, when we uh, do the analysis. So I love this sort of thing where I get this, this power spectrum from that one, this power spectrum from that, and this from here. Now, this then becomes a problem, right? Because, you know, it's, it's amazing if that's, a, if that's your physics. But if you're after this physics over here, it's a problem, right? Because you can see that it dominates this, it can dominate the signal level. I said that is a massive overestimate of what the actual primordial B-mode fluctuations would be by a factor of, I don't know, 100 or so, maybe you know, 50 or 100. So the uh, so if you're going to measure this, you have to do it in the presence of that, and which means you have to understand that one really well so that you can remove it from any potential signal that you see there. Uh, and that counts. Uh, just briefly here, because I know I'm going to run out of time, uh, 
lots of cool things you can do with the evolution of structure here. Uh, if, for example, uh, if you have massive free streaming neutrinos, then they will suppress structure formation. This is clearly not, you know, a, a, an exaggeration here, but this is the structure of large scales. If there were no neutrino masses, then it would be this on this, with this simulation, it would just be a, a line flat across. But as you add mass to neutrinos, you suppress the amount of structure on, you know, on different scales. And I've highlighted the galaxy cluster scale there. Uh, so again, in this case, by looking at galaxy clusters, you can actually understand something about neutrino masses in addition to what we did, we talked about with the lensed, uh, lensing mass. So uh, let me just mention, just take a, since I do a lot of galaxy cluster work, uh, this is actually the first PowerPoint slide I'd ever animated. And I'm thinking that was back in 2003. Uh, so, but I said, still, it's an oldie, but a goodie. Uh, so that's the coma cluster because that's the only picture I could get back in 2003. And uh, that's x-ray actually. And, uh, you know, the, the electrons are very hot, you know, 100 million degrees Kelvin. Uh, the electrons are bouncing around in there. Uh, they're not really bouncing around, but they're, uh, they're virally uh, uh, energized uh, just from the rotation, from the motion inside the galaxy. The cosmic wave background is coming in from all directions, but, you know, we'll just have it come here. And as those photons uh, scatter off of, the, uh, off the electrons, you can serve the number of photons, but you change their energy. So you shift them. And, uh, and that allows you to detect these things in the millimeter wave uh, by seeing, this is now frequency, low frequency, high frequency, C and B bands are marked here. Um, and uh, if, there were no if there was nothing, then no cluster, you would see this flat line. If the cluster is in your way, then you'll see the photons from lower energy shifted to high energy and it gives you this characteristic shape. So if you make a map at high frequency, you see, uh, sorry, at, at high frequency, you see an increment, right? And at low frequency, you see a decrement. So clusters will appear like a hole in the sky. Very easy to make things hot in the universe, like stars and galaxies. Very hard to make them cold, right? So, uh, so looking at clusters at the lower frequencies allows you to, 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 to so making maps at lower frequencies allows you to identify clusters. By the way, this simulation is also extremely old. This was done when sigma eight was one, okay? And the number of clusters goes to sigma eight to the seventh power. So when ACT was proposed, we said we were going to do that. And when we actually did it, we saw, I think we, I think we estimated 3,000 clusters and we got 30. Okay, just to give you an idea. Still exciting, but not as exciting as it would have been that one. Um, so, uh, so what's going on here? And again, as a person who studies clusters a lot, uh, you know, these maps, again, give you this idea that it's, oh, they just appeared, right? <laughs> no, they don't just appear, they grow with time. And back in the day, at a redshift of one, you're getting things which are similar masses, huge objects slamming together. I, I'm dramatizing it, but they do slam together. And, and when they do that, they release a lot of energy. Um, and uh, that, you know, these are the, some of the most energetic uh, events since the Big Bang, right? And you can just calculate, it's actually physics 101. Take two clusters, put them in infinity, at you know, two times 10 to the 14 solar masses and drop them in on each other, you can just calculate the potential energy and how much energy is released in that interaction. And so I study these a lot uh, with my Mustang instrument, but for cosmology, we don't care about how they got there. We just care that they're there. So, uh, and what I mean by that uh, is that we, we need to identify them first. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just Planck and uh, this is Zach, right? All right. Hard to tell, right? All right, so let me go back. There we go. Right. You can kind of get that there's something different going on in here. There's that. But uh, CMB people, or sorry, cluster people really don't care about the CMBs. All that stuff in the background, that's noise. Okay, that's CMB. So we get rid of it. And we're left with a map that looks like that, which is also equally uninteresting if you think about it. But if I were to then highlight this for you, then you'll see that uh, some of these things are come up as bright spots and some of them come up as dark spots. And the dark ones are the clusters and the light ones are, you know, a dusty star forming galaxy or something which is emitting. There. So we can actually take huge swaths of the sky uh, and, and do this kind of filtering and identify clusters that way. So why do we care? Well, oh, let me show you. Another. Sigurd Ness is, by the way, amazing. Uh, he makes things like this for us. But this is really what this is really the difference between Planck and I, right? You know, you really the, the large scale stuff is the same, but when you add the resolution of ACT to it, all of these point sources start to uh, 
that just pop out of the, of the maps. And you can just spend all day wandering through these things if you want to, to look for stuff. But just generally speaking, this is this is the best one for us. It really, you know, the, the moon isn't in our map. Though. Yeah. But uh, but you can see that, you know, that's what you would have seen with Planck. And then when you when you switch to ACT, you can actually see a cluster, in this case, right next to a quasar. Um, so lots of lots to be gained from this extra resolution. Uh, the what do we do with cluster science as well? You know, uh, this is just the the bunch of clusters from various uh, sources plotted versus redshift and just the um, the mass and so forth. And uh, it looks like a, like a lot of noise here. So this is now just simplifying that. You know, here's again redshift and then the mass, and here's one cluster, and that's one of our biggest one. We call it El Gordo for uh, means the fat one. Okay, and so it's really big. But it's also really big at a really high redshift. And what that says is basically, you know, sure, there are bigger clusters in this in the galaxy, but this is a big one really early, which means that not much time has gone past. Uh, again, for those of you, redshift to one is about half the age of the universe. So uh, so it hasn't a lot of time to form this thing, yet it's there, right? And so it's not, un, it's not you know, sort of impossible, right? But it's a very unlikely. So one of the things you can learn from this is not 10,000 clusters that are important. It's just that one that might not, that shouldn't be there, that, that starts to become sort of important. In addition to the statistics of having, having many of these things. So uh, just quickly act because we just took act down. Very sad about, actually I'm really happy about taking act down, I gotta tell the truth. I was the only one who knew how to fix the telescope and it broke a lot, right? So uh, I just said, I'm not doing it anymore. And uh, so uh, those of you who haven't been there, anybody been to act? Wow, uh, anybody benefited from act data? Yeah, a couple people, okay. Uh, so this is uh, just a picture of the site uh, from above. Uh, we built this back in 2003. That's me as a student uh, at the six meter telescope right across from there. I built that by myself. Oh my God, my son and I built that. Uh, and uh, that's climbing all over the telescope. Uh, as with anything, ACT just barely fits. When we, we upgraded ACT to this receiver here, you can see it just barely fits. Uh, I dropped that once out of there once broken uh anyway so uh so it's it's done but it did a lot of stuff uh when it was there uh and the reason i bring it up i just wanted to show you how hard these these measurements are uh this is the cmb okay and this is everything else right and the cmb is very small right it's 2.7 degrees kelvin but that's really big we're looking for temperature fluctuations around two micro kelvin level on the sky we're like making maps at that level uh, we have to do it in the presence of galactic dust. We're looking through the galaxy. Actually, there's also dust in our solar system or stuff in our solar system. But really, we also have to go through the atmosphere, which is really bright and, and changes with time. And our telescope happens to be 300 Kelvin, right? And it changes with time. So uh, when you think about it, we're trying to make, we're trying to suppress these signals by, you know, sort of eight orders of magnitude. Uh, in order to make the make the measurements we're doing, and it's quite tough. And most of that happens uh, as a combination of the instrument, people working with uh, uh, theoretical predictions of what you should see, and the analysis of this. So um, the you know that we do this in a, in a number of ways. Uh, one is we build big round screens. You can't see ACT for a reason because we built a big screen around it, so the ACT can't see the mountain and can't see the ground, can't see a truck driving by, can't see you walking by. Uh, Sigurd Ness once would made a map. Sigurd Ness is uh, one of the people who works on our analysis. Uh, we're using the ACT telescope and he said, Mark, he made it in ground coordinates, not sky coordinates, ground coordinates. He said, what's this dot over here in the map? It should see nothing, right? And I said, I don't know. So I walked out, I happened to be there. I walked outside the control room and I looked up there, big piece of plastic. You know, <laughs> sitting on the city of rubber, We're actually sitting on the ground. I don't know how it got there, but it's a big piece of rubber. I went and took it down. And so the ground screen actually does stuff and uh, and it shields us from that. Now, something like that doesn't matter because it it's static, right? It sort of just smears out. But uh, but having this ground screen out here is, again, trying to prevent photons from coming here because our detectors are indiscriminate. They don't care where the photon comes from, right? And so if you say it's from the sky, they'll say, okay. And that's what they do, right? So we have to really understand this. So we modulate the signal with halfway plates, uh, and but mostly what we do is put in many, many bands here. If I just knew the photons were coming from the CMB, and that's all that was out there in the universe, then you could just do this with one band, right? And just make it as sensitive as possible and throw all your detectors in one band. And that would give you the deepest map you could possibly make. 
But because you are trying to suppress all these other sources of signal, the synchrotron, uh, dust, uh, the telescope, and other things, you need to have multiple bands. And that allows you to do component separation. You can separate the different components of the signal mm -hmm. to get out what's left over, which is the scenic phase. All right, so that's hard. Uh, and I'm just going to flip through these. Act of beautiful. Act made beautiful maps. Act made even more beautiful maps that all look like noise. Uh, and uh, it's cool. But that's, you know, this is uh, E mode and B mode maps. And so these are real signal maps. Is that the Planck on the right and Max on the left? It's Planck, E, Planck. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. They both look like E's. B and E, uh, e and B. And then here's I plus Planck. You haven't, you haven't seen this? Sigurd Ness. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then we made these amazing cluster catalogs, which again, I do a lot of cluster work, so it's fun for me. Uh, and, you know, this, I could never have imagined making this when I was a kid, right? You know, this is now look back when I was in school, this was a large scale structure survey with optical telescopes, didn't look this good, right? And now we're going out and making these same kinds of uh, probes of where clusters are as a function of redshift with uh, with these millimeter wave maps. Uh, and this this catalog is, is available if anybody wants to, to play with it. Um, so, and then I was gonna briefly touch on some work that we did with the gravitational lens emotes uh, began because I find it fascinating. Uh, this map right here is a map of the, the CIB in the background, the dark and the light with then our, where we think the mass is by the deflection of the photons, this correlated, the photons passing through the through the formation of structure and looking at this uh, four point correlation function and they line up, they line up right on top of each other, right? And that's just, for me, it's just like so cool, right? Because it's basically, these, these photons had nothing to do, they weren't emitted from these, from the CIB. The CIB is coming, the cosmic infrared background is coming from the evolution of the, the formation of gal galaxies, basically. Where are the galaxies? Right, and where is their emission? Where's the light coming from? So you just look at, here's where the light's coming from. And then this is a mass map saying, where is the mass from these photons that were created at the, you know, at the big, uh, the CMB. So that correlation is, is amazing. And what's better than that is that when you use the CMB, the primordial signal to predict where the mass is gonna be using our cosmological model, that's also what you get, right? So it's, it's basically like saying, here I am, I measure the beginning of the universe, and I predict what it's going to be later on. So imagine I just said, okay, shoot an arrow over a wall. Can't see what's on the other side of the wall, but I'm going to tell you where to aim the arrow, right? And give the parameter, how far to pull back the bow, what angle to put it at, what, you know, whatever. Let go. And then it hits the target all, all the way on the other side. It's, it's a really amazing uh, measurement, which I enjoy showing. Uh, and I'm going to skip that because you don't have time. Okay. So moving on to the... Uh, the Simons Observatory, uh, because we want to do bigger and better things and we just can't stop ourselves, uh, we are going to do bigger and better things. And uh, Simons Observatory was funded by the Simons Foundation quite a few years ago. COVID got in the way and other things. Uh, uh, but it is designed to build a one large aperture telescope and three smaller aperture telescopes uh, near, right, you know, 100 meters away from the old ACT site. Uh, and it's funded, it involves an enormous number of institutions uh, who are you know, helping us, help us build a thing. So I've been showing this picture for quite some time now, but now I got this picture, which is very similar. You know, let me flip back and forth. Fantasy, reality, fantasy, reality, right? So, so now you have, uh, you have your three telescopes are actually being built. This is covered with a tarp, but it's really there. I'll show you a picture. And, uh, and the big telescope's actually a little bit better than that now, and all sorts of facilities for, you know, for, keeping, it, for keeping it going. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through this uh, just to show what we were talking about. The, the big telescope is called the Large Aperture Telescope because it's got a large aperture and it's a telescope. So there you go. Uh, and this is it at, in, at 10, but I'll show you some more, uh, more recent images. And the, the instrument here consists of three what we call optics tubes. And at the bottom of three, the three optics tubes is, are three arrays. And so each optic tube contains, um, each array has around 2,000 or so detectors. And so you can do your multiplication to get how many you can fit in the entire thing. So one of these optic tubes is basically like ACT. Okay, so it's, a, it's got quite a bit more uh, 
capability than ACTA. Now, the primary mirror is the same size as AD ACT was. Uh, and those of you who don't know optics say, well, how'd you get any better than that, right? Uh, the, the primary mirror just gives you the resolution. Uh, the the Aton Du, or the, the, the focal plane, uh, is the throughput for the telescope. And you'll notice the secondary mirror is almost as big as the primary mirror here, whereas an act is about a third the size. So that gives us an enormous focal plane to work with, and then we can pack more detectors into the system. Tons of stuff I can tell you about this, but basically the general idea is our detectors are as sensitive as they can be, okay, from Chile. So the only way to get a better map is to wait longer, and I don't want to die while I'm waiting for this, so waiting longer means 100 years, or make more detectors and put more on. So that's how that's why you build a telescope like this. So um, and then we have these three small telescopes. This is this is the uh, one of the telescopes on its on its uh, rotating platform here. We have three duplicate telescopes and their scan sky. Why do you build three? You need more detectors. It's just about it. You can't you can't make a better detector to help you. So if you want more sensitivity, it's just more detectors. And the geometry of these means you can't make a it's hard to make a bigger uh, thing. And I'll show you that in a minute. So you just make more. Where are we located? Uh, we're around 5,190 meters, 17,000 feet in uh, in northern Chile. Uh, the act site is buried behind Saratoco here. Uh, for those of you who know Alma, it's off about five kilometers in that direction. San Pedro is the nearest town where we, where we sleep, 35 kilometers. And then I'm just climbing up Saratoco for fun uh, and to take pictures, I guess. Uh, so that's where it's located. It looks like a desert because it is a desert. Uh, it's very dry and very hot. Half the atmosphere is gone. So the, the, the pressure there is, is half an atmosphere. Uh, and it's there's hard, you can see there's not a lot of water hanging out here. And both of those are bad for us. So getting rid of them. Uh, when you sell an observatory quite this expensive, uh, you can't just say, I want to do my niche science, right? You got to say you're doing everybody's science. Uh, and it's true. So I don't really talk about doing CMB maps anymore. I talk about making a millimeter wave survey. And the millimeter wave survey has lots and lots of different uh, uses, which I'll, I'll, I'll flip through here. We don't, we're going to run out of time, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each topic. But basically, anything from, again, the primary cosmology, which we just spent half an hour talking about, to talking about Planet 9. We can survey for Planet 9. Planet 9 puts out photons. I can find it, right? It's thermal photons. So it's there. if you knew where it was, it would be easy to find. It's just we don't know where it is. So doing a survey is really the only way to, to, to locate it. Probably not there. Um, but uh, we can look at extra Oort clouds even around other around near, nearby stars. Uh, we can do galactic astronomy. We've mentioned that. Really exciting is time domain astrophysics. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then again, extra galactic cosmology clusters and so forth. Um, so uh, I'm just going to briefly say the, the big telescope surveys 40% of the sky, the large average telescope. The small telescopes, you want to take that down as far as you can. So about 15% of the sky when we do that. We overlap with an enormous number of other, uh, well, most of the other major surveys that are out there. Uh, it's really hard to make it animate like this, by the way. I just want to say, it took me about an hour to figure that out. Uh, so, uh, so, but we were at Simon Observatory and Ruhr Observatory are, you know, essentially co-located. They're very near each other, and uh, but that doesn't really matter. But we're both surveying the same piece of the sky, and both advertised to be doing uh, temporal measurements, and that is that with these extra detectors from Simon Observatory, I have instantaneous sensitivity, which is many times mm -hmm. act. And that means that I can make a map every three days instead of every six months, right? So now I can say, we'll take that map and subtract it from the map the day before. And if something's changed, it's time variable or it's noise. So uh, so we can now output uh, uh, time, uh, a source list every, every uh, in this case, within 30 hours, every 30 day, every three days. And, and LSST or Ruben will be doing the same thing. And so you can actually go and now, now follow these things up. And you'll see all sorts of good stuff. You'll see, I mean, we see all, we see AGN all the time, but variable AGN, uh, tidal disruption would be super cool. We might see three or four of those over the lifetime. Stellar flares, eh, but somebody must be interested. And uh, so you can see those too. Um, uh, again, I don't have enough time to go through this, but suffice it to say, all these galaxy clusters, that's where all the baryons are. So uh, if you're making these big surveys of, of uh, these, these where clusters are, and again, their evolution with time, you can understand something about uh, how these, how galaxy evolution works. 
again, I'll, I'll leave this for people to look at later since I am really behind. Um, and uh, uh, this is, again, near and dear to my heart because uh, I used to fly a, a, a balloon-borne polarization submillimeter experiment, which went after um, a polarized emission in star forming regions. And uh, again, another entire talk on this. But uh, suffice it to say, magnetic fields align dust grains. Dust grains interact with photons uh, from star formation. And you can look at the polarized emission from those dust grains to infer uh, what how magnetic fields are affecting the formation of stars. Okay, that's a very short one hour talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but it's really cool, and we're going to be serving a whole bunch of these things with that. Not quite with the resolution of my former experiment, but but pretty good, and uh, certainly better than we were able to do with Planck and so forth. And you can connect those with ALMA observations as well. Um, and we already talked about this. Uh, we can go and, and learn about the B modes with these three instruments here. Uh, the levels that we're going to be getting uh, with advanced SO, which I'll mention in a second, are down to the you know, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 range, uh, which is, uh, again, very far down. If, if, if it's not there, it's going to be um, unusual, let's just say. So hopefully we'll put a, put a very good limit on that. And then finally, uh, with this lens B modes, we can actually, again, put limits on, on a on the maps of neutrinos. And this is sort of important because, again, you can think of the universe as a relativistic particle detector in this way. And we can sort of limit uh, uh, the, the existence of certain kinds of light particles uh, down to, again, down to the first instance of the, uh, of the universe. So again, these are really sort of fundamental measurements that can be done with this, with this telescope. Uh, and then if you're ever interested in ancient uh, controversies, okay. Uh, most people are, uh, this is not real. Okay. But this is the kind of error bar that we would be getting. And so if you get that error bar and we're still sitting over here, uh, you know, some, you, you can only call it just a tension, right? That's just a disagreement at that point. And so you're going to have to figure that out. Uh, and we're going to skip that. Uh, so talking about, uh, the, the Simon observatory, this is the telescope again, for those of you who don't build instruments, and I'm guessing most people here don't. Maybe. Okay. I'm going to show you how they work. All right. So if photons come in, they bounce off the primary mirror onto the secondary mirror, and then they go to the focal plane back there. Uh, and that then goes into the receiver. So this receiver is sitting here, right? And uh, so the photons enter into one of 13 windows, and each of those is a focal plane. So each window corresponds to a different position on the sky, right? And the whole thing is scanning back and forth like this. So we're scanning, we're instantaneously. This is around you know nine degrees from here to here on the sky, okay, eighteen times the size of the moon, and you're scanning that across around about one hundred and twenty degrees, just going back and forth, back and forth, scanning the sky. They go into what we call one of these optics tubes over here, and that's an optics tube. Uh, I could spend another hour talking about just this thing. I'm very proud of it, but we're going to skip that. Uh, uh, but the photons come in, and then they go through a series of lenses. They refract, uh, and they end up on this this focal plane here. Telescope's 300 Kelvin. Uh, there is a, an 80 Kelvin stage here. There's a 40 Kelvin stage here, which you can't see. That's 4 Kelvin. That's 1 Kelvin. And that's 0 0.05 Kelvin. Okay, so colder and colder and colder. I'll tell you why that is in a second, but it's cold. Okay? So the photons end up on the focal plane back there. And a miracle occurs over here as far as you're concerned. And we read out the detectors. It's, a, again, another several hour long talk. Um, and uh, that focal plane, one of the three arrays looks like that. And you zoom in, it looks like that. You zoom in, and it looks like that. And you'll begin to see these two little antennas in there. That's called an orthomode transducer. So each one of those horns, the photons come in like, doesn't really look like that, by the way, but you get the idea. Photons come in, and they go down onto this, and that's how you get polarization. All okay? right. So one, one, one picks up one polarization, the other picks up the other polarization. And if you look carefully, you see they're not all oriented the same in the array, but uh, there are two polarizations each. And then there are four detectors on each of these, two polarizations and two frequencies per detector. So four detectors per, per pixel, if you'd like, on the, on, the, on the system. All right. How does that work? Well, there's the CMB back up again, and there are detectors. I used to make detectors that look like this when I was a graduate student. Don't anymore. But uh, now they look like this. But the same idea applies. Uh, photons come in if it's coming from a hot spot. 
it hits this. This is 0 0.05 degrees Kelvin or 0 0.1. If it hits this, it warms it up. We're going to measure how much it warms up. That tells you it's warmer where you're looking. If it comes in from a different spot, it's colder, it cools down a little bit, right? That's all we do. We measure the temperature of this little thing. In this case, it's the temperature of these little islands over here, but the same, same idea. So we're able to then calibrate and then measure what the temperature of the sky is by measuring the temperature of this. They're called bolometers. That means heat meter, essentially. So um, we'll skip this. It's a very complicated piece of equipment and very impressive. But it cools about, about uh, I don't know, 12 graduate students worth of material down to 4 degrees Kelvin and, uh, and about uh, 120 kilograms down to 0 0.05. So it's a, it's a very uh, um, effective piece of instrument. Uh, this is just a few weeks ago when I was down in Chile. Uh, we're installing six of the optics tubes are installed now. A seventh one goes up there, and then the advanced Simons Observatory fills the rest. Uh, cool optics tube won't spend any time on that. Uh, we did actually verify this thing works, and so we have this in the case we're measuring one of the optics tubes that has pass bands at 90 gigahertz and 50 gigahertz. Uh, those who were on ACT realize, remember, we had lots of issues with the beams on ACT, how they, how they illuminated the sky. So now we've measured those really well in the lab, so we're pretty confident that they will not have those same issues we're doing it that. So everything is ready to go uh, for observations. Uh, the small optical telescopes have follow a similar story here where we have, but now there's no mirror, they're really just a lens, right? And the aperture of the lens determines the resolution on the sky. And so, and they have the same arrays down here, except one of these has seven arrays in it. Um, and you basically, the photons come in, they go through a series of filters and lenses and they, they form, uh, they, they go into the same kinds of arrays down there. Um, and uh, those are now, two of those are now fielded on the sky right now, one's pending. Uh, and again, this is just a distribution of how the, how the frequencies work. And I'll skip forward. Uh, and they just got uh, first light a few weeks ago. And this is just the team, again, this is Suzanne Stagg, the co uh, my fellow co-director of the observatory. Uh, and let me see. So they got first light uh, last year. Uh, that's a very impressive, and in my mind, very impressive image of Jupiter. Uh, you know, it's not Hubble quality, but you get the idea. It's a dot on the sky, but it means it works. And so, uh, so now we're going to be starting to make maps. There's the moon. It's, it's bigger, as you might have guessed. Uh, so that's all happening as we speak. Um, the LAT, the big telescope, uh, this receiver is done. It's on the telescope. It's, it's looking at nothing, uh, which is very depressing for me. Uh, because this has enough power currently on the sky. It's got 30,000 textures to do basically all of ACT in what, two years, maybe a year or two. Yeah, it's, and we've been, we offered to ACT for 15 years. So, uh, and, uh, and everything's right. The telescope works, the receiver works, the data acquisition all works. Mirrors uh, are a problem. Uh, the, the German company that's making them uh, discovered an issue uh, with some of the panels, uh, some fraction of the panels of the mirror. And they're having to remanufacture them, so we're delayed. Uh, so we could be taking data right now, but we're we're waiting for the mirrors to come back in to finish that. So that's all underway. Uh, so our 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 formal uh, calendar sort of looks like this, where we um, we basically are in this. We're ending up our construction of the of the system here. We're beginning observations of the the smallest the small optical telescopes pretty soon. You know, science observations, and then the the large aperture telescope is we're beginning more like next year uh, to give the observations. And then we're upgrading the instrument from the seven optics tubes we have here to filling all 13. And then we'll continue for another six years or so uh, observing with the full observatory. Uh, at the same time, Ruben's coming online and then we'll be able to do transient triggering with them and, and do it, lots of follow up with that. So lots happening over the next couple of years to make this work. Uh, and I'm going to skip over there. We're just building more, more stuff. Right, uh, but that's the advanced time observatory building more detectors for the LAT, and uh, an enormous component of the advanced time observatory funded by the National Science Foundation is software. About about a little over about forty percent of what we do is is data management. Right, so the instrument is very hard, and I, I I build the instrument, so I spend a lot of time on that. But the 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 software involved from taking it from a time order data that is like. It's now, you know, have just, just points on the sky uh, to making an actual science quality map. It's, it's a huge amount of effort. 
So this is a very expensive piece of instrumentation. And about a third of what we do goes into that, that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, I just want to end up with a, with a green point. Uh, uh, I, I burn swimming pools full of diesel every year. I mean, I'm not kidding you because it's, it's, we're a remote site. And so there's no power. So it's all diesel. We're bringing trucks every other day to power the instruments. So uh, the NSF uh, generously gave us enough money to build a essentially about a 1.5 megawatt solar plant uh, down down the mountain, which will then set, you know, when it's sunny out and we have batteries, oh, you should never hear a generator. Uh, it's only the generators that come in when it's cloud, essentially. So we hope to replace about 70% of the power with uh, green energy, saving about 2 million kilograms of CO2 per year. That's actually happening right now. I mean, they're, uh, that'll be built at this time next year and, and up and operating. And, uh, and then there's a the future, right? So there is the Simons Observatory down over here. And you see the three telescopes, the big telescope and the old ACT telescope. And we're hoping this is all, uh, you know, Sort of in process that SO Japan will build one SAT, which will go on the old ACT site, and uh, SO UK will build two more SATs, which will go on some uh, platforms from Polar Bear, Simon's Array, they're there, and then maybe there's SO France, we'll see. Uh, and then CMBS4, right? And so there's a whole bunch of space over here for CMBS4, and again, all the infrastructure here can serve CMBS4, the, the green energy can conserve them as well, and so hopefully this will all be coming together over the next, uh, next decade. And I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I went away. Thank you very much. Questions from the room? Yes. yes. Uh, there's a bunch of LSST and Euclid people here as well. And I, I've always wondered about the SO and LSST because LSST seems to be saying, we're going to have all of these possible events and people are welcome to follow it up. And I think we're saying we're going to have all of these events and people are welcome to follow it up. Is there any over, I mean, are, are, is there any plans for them to look at our stuff or our stuff? To look at well, okay. So I've always wondered about this too. So let me give you my, my opinion on that. So one is LSST is, I've seen their talks on their transient uh, plans and how to and how to communicate those to the world and triggers and everything like yeah, that. Exactly. They're way more sophisticated than we are. Exactly. Okay, so there's no question. There's no point in LSST and ACT working together because we're still doing it anyway. I'm not, LSST is not going to stop what it's doing and, and go after an ACT thing because they're doing it anyway, right? Every night they go and hit the same piece of sky. So there's no reason to, to follow it up. These triggers are meant for target options like ALMA, you know, holy crap, we just saw a title sourcing event, you know, and those last uh, the title sourcing event is when, a, you know, two big things come together, you know, they, and they tidally disrupt you, you know, something falling into a black hole. So, uh, and those can last months, right? So uh, you get follow up from that uh, to do that. But we're never, the idea that we're going to have synergy together, I think is not, doesn't make any sense, right? Is it mean, it does make sense, but you can, you can look at it 10 years from now because the, the, all the data will still be there from those two. But if you want to get very specific information, then you have to supply them. And so part of the advanced time observatory data pipeline is to develop what you just said, is to get, first of all, produce these maps on 30 in 30 hours uh, from when they're taken, and then to get them to the same kind of uh, triggering system that other people can utilize. And the part of the problem is we're going to see a bazillion variable stars, right? We're going to see a ton of AGN variability. And so the challenge is not going to be actually making the maps. It's going to be determining which ones we want people to waste their to spend their time on to follow up with. Which one is a TDR, right? Right, you know, and it, a TDE, sorry, a title disruption event. That that I think is going to be the real challenge. And the same thing for basically for LSST too. Everything's going to be varied with these sensitive instruments. So we're going to have to keep looking to just to boil it down because eventually people will stop saying, "Well, I'm not going to follow that up." You, it was just a, it was just a variable star you sent me after, and it wasn't worth my time. Yes, yeah, so we spent a lot of time you, talking. Oh, I'm sorry. So he's asking about, um, are you really, I think I'm going to summarize it in a much, in a much meaner way. Uh, how, how well do you have to do to remove the galactic foreground to the level that you need to to achieve the science goals that you're that you are, you're advertising, and uh, let me just switch. There we go. So, um, 
the answer is, uh, I don't know the answer to your question. And it's not going to be limited by our sensitivity, right? It's my guess. It'll be limited by other things. And uh, so we've spent some time talking about this, but, you know, these bands, they're, they look pretty simple, but they're not simple, right? The bands are complicated. And, uh, and you see that they're, you know, we, we put them at this exact location, but maybe they're not the exact location, right? Maybe they're, maybe they're moving around. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about how the atmosphere might be affecting the past bands as a function of time. Uh, a lot of those things introduce noise into the analysis, right? And so then it just reduces your sensitivity, right? So, so the I think as we go deeper and deeper and deeper, we're going to have to start to figure these out. But there are games you can play. Uh, for example, if you know these bands with infinite precision and they are different, then that actually gives you two different bands, right? So if you actually know the bands better, then you can do you can do a better job with that. If you really run into trouble, you're going to have to start to split the bands. But that would at the at the cost of sensitivity. You have to see where you bottom out. Right now, we're not there yet. And so there's no reason to take that hit to sensitivity. But I think eventually, one might feel another instrument. You could put, we have 13 output tubes, pull one out. All I got to do is replace the filters in the detectors, really, and put in something slightly different. And that gives me more, more resolution. Why frequency resolution? For frequency resolution. Why are the three bands, uh, the last three in gray? They're not Because I can't do them, they're from satellites. Okay. Right. So you need you need a size. So Lightbird, for example, has what ten bands or something like that. Ten is that ten? Yeah. yeah. For this reason, right? I mean, it's because they can, right? They don't. In other words, our bands are placed where the atmosphere allows us to place mm -hmm. them. Um, but if you had if you had access to all this, you you do all sorts of different. You'd have a band there, right? Why not? Right. Mm -hmm. But that's where it would have a huge. It's a water line. Water line. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you can't. And so the, the advantage of going to space is enormous uh, for the for the frequency resolution, uh, sorry, the, for the frequency access. Hello, thank you. Yeah. Yes, so I have a question regarding SUT and transition to SO. So what what what's the next let's say plan for SUT regarding the data release and, and results which still need to be oh. published? And, and and is there any plan uh, with the well, if you've been around two years ago, I would have said, do you want it? <laughs> uh, because we, uh, we, sh we shut it down, we took it apart. It's, so the plans are, uh, it's going, the telescope is going to be used at an educational facility down in Chile. So we're giving it to a uh, local university and they're going to put it up to, I don't know, do something with. And uh, the instrument, frankly, uh, it's going to be back in my lab soon. I have this idea. I'm going to fill it full of lucite and then cut it in half and put it up as a display. But so that's my plans for ACT. Okay. And that's only if I have time. Uh, in terms of the data release, uh, we're, you know, we have weekly meetings on this and uh, there's, uh, they're, you know, it'll be out, I don't know, soon ish. Could be very soon. We'll see. Including the cosmological analysis with the telescope. Yeah. 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 That's, uh, we look at it every week. I know it's an act. No, we're not giving up on that. I mean, in fact, now that the uh, frankly, when you think about it, us being delayed by a year sort of helps that, right? Because uh, if if I started putting out, remember the mapping speed of this instrument is nine times the mapping speed of ACT. More than that, more a little more. It's like in that range. And so, uh, in a year, you would be people who were interested in ACT analysis would be enticed away to working on this, is my guess. But uh, part of our deliverables for advanced science observatory to the National Science Foundation is to actually analyze ACT maps. And so the same, the same software infrastructure we're developing that can actually be applied to ACT. We'll be testing it on that. So, so all that's going to happen is testing, you know, that's part of our charge. Other questions? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, what was SO's like the R? Uh, like R. Yeah. The like, one sigma I did I did show it. I just didn't I didn't highlight it. Uh, it's <laughs> one point two times ten to minus three is the one sigma number, and that's could be compared to CMBS four, which is uh, five times ten to minus four. I think is their number. Is it three? It's five. It's five times ten. And, and the limit on that is coming from like the number of Yeah, I mean you can do that. That calculation you can almost do in 20 minutes, right? You just, uh, the, the, the subtleties of that come from uh, sky coverage. Uh, in other words, I can, I can tell you the depth of the map pretty quickly, given the number of detectors and the integration time and stuff we know about the site. Uh, but 
the devil's going to be in the details of all of these things as we get down to um, foreground subtraction and uh, um, as we go deeper and deeper. But we're not going to hit that limit, I think, for a couple of years as we integrate down. But to get down to that number there, you know, I think we have to wait, right? And there's going to be a lot of stuff that has to be worked out uh, to, to make sure we can get down to that number. And, and five times ten of my score, same thing, right? You're going to have to just do this. So the difference in the sky coverage comes from how much you think you can de-lens. Remember this B mode, how much you think you can de-lens from the cosmic infrared background itself. So now if you know where the earth matter is, you can predict how much the E mode signal will be lensed to produce B modes from that. So there's a, there's a correlation to that. And uh, that's called A lens, you know, what fraction that you think is of that B mode power you can get from just the CIB. And uh, when you go to larger coverage, uh, you can do more with the CIB. When you go to smaller coverage, like uh, say 7% of the sky, then you, the CIB is no longer adequate for doing that. And you need to use your own telescope to actually directly measure the lensed E modes, the B modes from the lensed E modes. And that's what, that's what CMBS4 is planning on doing. So they're building a special telescope in Antarctica that's only, well, only, I mean, primary task is just to de-lens, right? So, and again, we haven't done that before, right? So we haven't had to de-lens, and so we don't know how well we'll have to be, and that'll also be subject to foregrounds, right? So all of these things will be will be coming into play um, as we go deeper and deeper, and we're gonna learn more. I mean, I've been doing CMB for, for a long time now, and we've never run into a, an insurmountable barrier yet, but boy, do these problems look hard, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but they looked hard before, right? And we always got past them. If you told me we could make a map from the garbage I produced from ACT, I'd be like, really? Right? And then, you know, the analysis people are able to do all this component separation because we designed the experiment very well. But when you look at the raw data, you're like, wow. Uh, and then you see what they're able to do with it. And it was good. But eventually they're going to come back to us and say, hey, we really could use another band. Or, hey, you know, you need to measure this more accurately in order for us to do this. So, and that, that's going to be happening. I mean, I, I just can't believe it's going to go to quite the plan over the next 10 years. In 10 years, we're going to say we need something else. Other questions? Other questions from the room? Okay, I don't see any on Zoom, so I think we can, uh, we can stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah. You are free to, I mean, the coffee and the cookies are still there, so you are free to run around. Yes, you want to answer that. Uh, I want to, I want to uh, pass the colloquium organization to other people. We found uh, one volunteer, so Florence has uh, been uh, kind enough to, um, <clears throat> to, take, uh, to take over a part of the colloquium, but she needs help. <laughs> it's something that one cannot do alone. So it would be very nice if some, someone could volunteer. Please let Matteo and I know. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh. This was exciting. Exciting. I like to be excited. <laughs> well, I'm not doing this